Okay. Went up 150,000 views over the past month. That's crazy. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. Once again, my name is Michael Markowski, and today we are going to recreate another artwork by another one of my favorite artists. And today is the first of the fifth season, almost four years since I started doing these weekly live streams. And uh, we are going to begin by looking at the art of Andy Warhol and starting off 2024 by recreating this painting or print by Andy Warhol as well as this one, <laughs> this one, and this one here. So I've got a bunch of them queued up and I've, I was up till 3.30 in the morning last night getting things ready for this episode. So there's a bunch of the, 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 the long laborious work is out of the way so we can really kind of just get right to the, the matter today. So I'm really excited to um, focus on Andy Warhol's cats to start out 2024. So um, f let's. Uh, it's been. A, feels like it's been a while since I've done this. So let me get myself oriented here. Um, the plan for today's episode. We're. I'm gonna do the image transfer. The input. Aim, so and I'll show you how to how to do all that. In fact, I've already done done that as well as the. Ooh, the next step here, which is to stain the canvas. We're going to talk a little briefly about Warhol's biography because I've done that recently in, the, in some episodes we did back in December talking about that. So there's not a lot more that I want to add to that. And uh, then we're going to... There, it's not really underpainting for today's episode. We're really just going to, to um, apply a, a simple wash of color and then apply an outline in black. But I've got a bunch of different ones and some little different techniques that I might use throughout to, to make that happen. So there's going to be kind of a lot of action in today's episode, as well as an appearance by um, a special guest star today. And so uh, we'll talk about that when um, the moment arises. You'll see her appearance here shortly. So just as always, just before we begin, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Most of the people, the vast majority of people who watch these episodes, who are watching me right now are not subscribers to the channel and that would really help. So I just mentioned off the top, 150,000 people watched videos by me over the past month and yet only a thousand of those people subscribe to the channel. So if even an extra two or 3,000 of those people hit the subscribe button. That would be huge for me, right? So you could do me a favor if you're watching right now, hit the subscribe button. You can always unsubscribe later if you're not happy. Um, and of course the notification bell so you know when upcoming episodes are going to take place. And if you want to support the channel, what are these are all zoomed in and out, uh, with a small donation as little as a dollar through PayPal, through the Super Chat while we're here live, or um, by sending an e-transfer or check in the mail by contacting me through my email. Uh, my email's on the Facebook group, which I'll talk about here in a moment, as well as on my website. And all those links are down there below. So let's, uh, let's get right to the matter at hand here. Let's go right up to the top. And let's start with our image transfer process. Now, let me show you where you can find some images that you can use to create today's um, artwork. So just before I show you that, here's our Facebook group. And so for every episode, I do a little write up and post it there. And um, so I, I encourage you to join the Facebook group so that you can 
upload an artwork that you've created, perhaps inspired by today's episode or something you were creating while you were listening or watching to today's episode. Um, whether you're doing the drawing series I started four years ago or something else, uh, I would love to see what you're working on and, and to give you some free feedback if you want. So if you want to participate in that, join the Facebook group here. The link is down there in the description for that. And in uh, next, not next week, but the week after, next two Tuesdays from now, I'm going to do a feedback episode and I'm going to really focus on the paintings because last time we focused on drawing. So this next one coming up is all the paintings that we've done in a little while that we haven't talked about. So that's the plan a couple weeks from now. So anyway, um, if you click on the, down in the description below, there's a link for a Dropbox folder for outlines. And if you click on that, it'll take you to this folder and you're going to see there's a lot of stuff in here. At the very top is our resources. If you're just beginning and you've never painted before, here's how to get started. And then the next, uh, I don't know, 50 folders are for kind of beginners episodes. And then the next, I don't know, 150 folders are for a little bit more complex. And you're going to see there's names here. You've like Leonardo da Vinci, Pablo Picasso, Van Gogh, lots of names you may recognize, and probably a lot more that you've never heard of, artists from all over the world. But we are going all the way back up to near the top here to this folder, um, 00U-Andy Warhol. i got to figure out a better um, naming convention and everything. That's on the list of things to do. So near the top of this list, and inside that folder, you'll see this is where we had our one of our Marilyn Monroe images we did last year, and then, or maybe it was a couple years ago. And then in here, you'll see all of these files for today's episode. You'll see the original images in color, and then outlines I did on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app to trace over the outlines. And so you'll have a JPEG and a PDF version of those outlines that you can download and then print out on your inkjet printer at home. So, um, having said all that, let's... Um, I want to do this. Well, I've got a, I've I've done all of the outlining that I need to do, and so I there's I don't know maybe a dozen outlines. So maybe what I I'll do here is just uh, show you some of that footage that I recorded, and then talk over a bit of this. How am I going to do this? Uh, just let me just... It's been a while since I've done this type of approach here. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit strange because you're going to see me jump back into time and I'll, I'll have this playing and you'll hear me talking while I talk about this step here. So this is me from last night doing some of these outlines. You can see I'm applying this image that I downloaded and printed off the, uh, the, from the Dropbox folder. And I'm applying it to a 9 by 12 size canvas, canvas board. And now I'm about to use some carbon transfer paper. And so I take that carbon transfer paper and I'm going to put it underneath the, the printout from the Dropbox folder. And then I'm going to go over these lines here. And so I'm not going to um, show you the whole thing because there's a lot of them and this is going to save us a little bit of time. 
So you'll see, I'm gonna scroll over that. And then I'm gonna do it a second time on a new different canvas. And then I, what you see me doing here is doing this on a, um, a few other pieces of cardboard. So I've got a few different thicknesses of board in order to try to make a stencil. So um, here's a, a, I think I did one with a um, FedEx envelope. I think this is what that is. And then one with another envelope that was maybe a little bit thicker. So yeah, here's another envelope. So you're seeing me using this carbon paper process to trace out these images onto multiple boards. And this is going to, you'll see how these come into play later on. Okay, so in this instance, now what I'm doing is I'm cutting out this, um, the tracings that I did on these cardboard stencils. And so that's for one of these images here. And pretty self-explanatory. I wish uh, QuickTime was easier at... Let's get another one. So here you can see this is the FedEx envelope. It's a little bit thinner. Okay. So now I'm going to do another one here. I'm taking another one of these pictures. And there's it's pretty self-explanatory. I'm just going to kind of quickly skim through this. We don't need to... Here's another one and another one. So you'll see that now I've got a bunch and then I got a fingerprint on that one. Okay. Um, I suppose... Do I want to talk about this next? Um... Well, maybe, okay, so what you see me doing here is, this is for another thing that I want to do today, which is to uh, do uh, Andy Warhol's blotted line technique. So I'm using, uh, maybe, maybe well, let's, let's keep things um, all, all together here. We'll come back to that. Um, so that this will, okay, let me just get this all queued up. Okay. Okay, so now what we've got is we've got a whole bunch of outlines traced out onto canvases. And now I'm going to show you the, the imprematura process, okay? So, once you've got those outlines transferred onto canvases, then you may or may not want to stain the canvas uh, to get started. Now, the fastest way would be just to completely skip this next step and just to move right into the thing that we're going to do here in about five minutes. But I, I recorded all of this and I thought maybe I'll show it to you so that if you're interested in doing it, you, you can see how I got the results that I got. And so maybe before I do that, let's just talk about the, the painting um, uh, approach that I use throughout all of these episodes over the past almost four years now, I use what's called a split primary palette. Now, I'm not the one that invented this, but I wish I knew about this 20 years ago when I was in art school, because no one taught me this when I was in art school. It wasn't until I was, after I got my master's degree, and then I was starting to teach my, uh, well, teach myself, while well, I was teaching myself, but once I became a teacher, 
and I, you know, I was like, okay, well, let's kind of let's go back to some of the foundational stuff, um, and uh, let's let's what is the easiest technique I can teach new students about painting, and then I stumbled upon this. It's not it's not unknown, but certainly I wish it was way more known when I was maybe 10, 12, 15 years old. It would have saved me a lot of time. So anyway, this I think this is the best way of learning how to paint, is the split primary palette technique. And so essentially what this means is you can go to the art supply store and just buy eight tubes of paint and really mix about 95% of all the colors the human eye can see. And that's a game changer because that allows you to paint any of the paintings we've done from throughout in the entirety of human history. Um, rather than buying one set of paint that is good for portraits, one set of paint that's good for classical portraits, one set of paint that's good for uh, impressionist painting, one that's good for pop art paint, and one that's good for landscapes, and that's gen that's how I learned to paint. And uh, I, f I found that um, overwhelmingly complex. So here what we've got is two tubes of yellow paint, two tubes of red paint, two tubes of blues, a white, and a black. And in fact, you don't even really need black. We may use black today though, but we can mix our own black using a combination of three of these six tubes of paint up here. Because every color has a temperature. It's either cool or warm, some more than others. Um, but knowing how to use color temperature is really the most effective way to create depth in a painting. Or it's one of the, the effective ways. But, I, but certainly, maybe the, 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 um, the, well, it's just a very effective way. I'm going to say it's better or worse, but it works really, really well. So the palette that I'm going to use is this Amsterdam grade of paint, um, uh, Amsterdam brand of paint. Now I'm not sponsored by Amsterdam. They haven't given me a single penny's worth of free things, no discounts. I go and buy it just like anybody else at your local art supply store. And yet I find it's the, the, the best bang for the buck. I think it's the cheapest paint that's also the highest quality. So highest quality per price ratio. So a tube of paint like this costs, um, in fact, literally just before this episode began, I, I, the, Postman dropped off a huge box of, of paints of these that I just ordered for my in-person classes and for these classes. And I paid about $15 Canadian for these 250 milliliter tubes. Now those were on sale at roughly about $17. So in American, you're talking about $13, $14, dollars $12 for a tube of this paint here. And I would try to look for something around that price. If you're paying $20, $25 for one of these tubes of paint, you can find it cheaper somewhere else. So keep your eyes peeled. And you really shouldn't need to spend more than $25 for a 250 milliliter tube of paint. Having said that, you can use, let's say, golden acrylic, right? And so this is a tube of golden paint that I paid about $30 for and you could see this is what 59 milliliters so it's there's literally five of these tubes of paint inside of here and it's twice the price right so but it is I would say maybe 30% better in quality but most people won't notice the difference anyway so I would consider getting a cheaper brand of paint but hey if you got the money to throw around why not um, now I'm going to flip through a whole bunch of other paints that you can use and these are the 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 palettes the, the tubes that I would suggest you get you got Liquitex and Lascaux, Windsor and Newton, M. Graham and Co. Acrylex, Buzz, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Krilla, Nova Color, Gwartzmann's, Chroma Color, Sennelier Abstract, Montmartre, Triart High Viscosity, Riotech, uh, Natural Earth Paint, De Sears Dacryl Collegial, Faber Castell, Stedler, Opus, Acrylicos Vallejos, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply Chain, Derwent Academy, Mary's or Shanghai Paint, Febacryl, 
Um, but a couple of tubes or brands of paint that I'm not, I, I do not recommend are Museum Color and Peebo. Peebo, by the way, is one of the largest brands around the world. But both of these paints use a lot, I mean, too much um, titanium white mixed into their paint as a filler. And that just means you'll never get a really saturated color. It's always going to be... a um, a bit muted, a bit pastel, and you certainly won't be able to mix a black like I do. So, um, and it's possible some of those other brands that were listed above also have the same problem that Peebo and Museum Color have, but I haven't used them all, so I can't say whether or not they work, but I know these don't work. So, let's, um, uh, let's get into this here let's i'm going to show you st me staining this canvas here and what's live here what am I? okay <laughs> this is so disconcerting what having this feed okay i feel like my hands should be moving on those are my hands on the right mixing paint but my hands aren't doing anything right here so you could see me what I'm doing is I, I put some of the warm acrylic uh, warm yellow paint um, onto my palette and then I added some water to it and now I am about to stain I think five canvases here so that's why there's a lot of water and there's um, a lot of paint in here because I'm doing this for many canvases. So let's uh, I'm just gonna skip ahead here. So you can see me just, I'm taking this and I'm gonna apply it on this canvas. Let's do a bunch of them here. All right, so really what I'm doing with that paint is I'm, I've made a fairly thin, watery mixture that stains that surface. That's what the imprimatura means. It's the priming layer, right? It's it's a, a something that artists have done for 600 years now as a way of getting an artwork off the ground quickly. But it also serves all sorts of purposes. Um, first of all, it just obliterates the scary white surface. It's like, oh, where do I start? <coughs> You put some kind of color on there, boom, the white's gone, painting is, you've taken off, the plane is off the ground, and you're you're flying already. Um, so it sort of just gets that scary thing out of the way. For me, it's a little bit of just that, that routine. I don't even have to think about it. I just squeeze some paint out, start going. Uh, another thing it does is, is it just creates kind of a, a little bit more of a complicated surface and so that if there's gaps between colors, instead of just being white paint there, you've got some yellow. And that just makes the painting look a little bit kind of... Um, uh, it makes the, the painting look just a little bit more evolved, a little bit more um, professional. It, it, it signals to the viewer that there's maybe... Um, you're doing something that they haven't heard of before that might make them think that you're maybe a little bit smarter or more educated or talented or you've got some skills that maybe the general public isn't aware of, right? So all those things just lend that painting something a little bit extra. And, um, and so rather than having a painting, that even if it doesn't turn out very well, it just looks slightly more professional right and and I think if you're a beginner painter anything you can do to give your painting a little bit of an advantage is desirable right so um, what you see me doing here is just I'm kind of going over some of the paintings that I've already applied that yellow to and just kind of brushing it down a few extra times um, taking any of the excess paint off that surface now, this is really the only time that I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic paint. There's no law against it, but I think it's a, 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 a good idea. So, let's skip forward here. 
Okay. I'm just gonna show you here. So what I'm doing is I'm just blow drying all of these surfaces to dry them off so that I can go to the next step because I want that yellow to be as dry as possible so that it doesn't get mixed in to the, the, next, um, the next little thing that I'm about to do. So, let me show you this here. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm applying. I'm going to mix my own little brown uh, color here and mix it in with some white paint in order to create a uh, uh, kind of off-white newspaper-like surface that I'm going to paint over top of these yellow paintings that I've just made here. So I'm scooping a little bit of paint out. In fact, I you'll notice that I barely used any of that red or blue and I actually put some of it back into those jars because I didn't use enough of them. So here, let's see what's what I'm about to do. Uh, okay so I'm taking a little bit of that yellow, taking a little bit of this red, stirring them up. So to make a brown, you take your yellow and then you add some red to it. And so red and yellow make orange. And then you add blue to it to turn it from an orange into a brown. Brown is really just all three of your so-called primary colors mixed together. Um, and the more blue you put in there, the darker it's going to get, right? So. You have, in this instance, it's probably like, I don't know how much, maybe 85% warm yellow, uh, maybe 10% warm red, and 5% warm blue. So just a little bit of warm blue just gives it that little bit of a sandy color. And I'm barely going to use much of that paint at all. And what I'm going to do, because I'm applying it onto five of these canvases to make something like this surface here. Let me... um, is I'm going to mix a, a, a white and then add a little bit of that brown <clears throat> that I've mixed off on the side there. And in this jar that I created here, I took some uh, matte medium. Matte medium is just acrylic paint that has no color in it. So I squeezed probably 70%. So this next mixture here that I'm making is about 70% matte medium with about 28% titanium white and then about two or three percent of that brown that I made. You can see me just kind of mixing a little bit of that there into the mixture and then stirring it up and then I kind of decide on like, oh that's actually maybe a little bit more brown than I even expected and so I think I add a little bit more white into that mixture. You could see here, I'm going like, ah, oh, I need a little bit more of that, that white. So I'm going to put a bit more white in there and stir it again. Okay. So let me just show you as I'm applying this paint. First thing I realized, I'm like, oh man, this is a little bit too transparent. 
I'm, I maybe put in maybe a bit too much matte medium. So I end up doing this, uh, I paint over the surface for the first time, I blow dry it, and then I apply a, a second coat. And that second coat was really effective. And I think you'll see here in a moment when I show you these, they turn out really, really well. Like I'm really happy with these surfaces. They just look really, uh, they look like someone has spent some time preparing them, right? And I know for many people they are just like, well, that seems like a major waste of time. All of this stuff uh, that you're doing here, you know, serves no purpose. It's just busy work. Perhaps some, you know, it's, it's, you know, all art is totally subjective. But for me, preparing a surface like this is, is really satisfying because um, it, like, it's, it just, it, it helps create like a really solid foundation for, an, to build an artwork upon. You know, it's sort of like, spending a little bit more time to set the dinner table really nicely folding all the napkins nicely you know it just it's it's that extra little you know or, or the way that you plate the food and putting the garnish on there right it just or it's like marinating your steak overnight you know it 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 it, it um I, I even think it just gives you more confidence when you're painting on top of it that you've given it that extra little bit of care and attention. Um, I think just makes you just feel better when you're working on the, the artwork that goes on top of those surfaces. Okay, so... Um, I don't know how much more of this we need to see here at the moment. Um, I'm just thinking maybe should I just skip to this next uh, step? Okay, I think I'm going to here. Oh my goodness, look at all these comments. My screen was on... <laughs> Great point, Lolly says. Maybe you should make a little separate video clip of all the paint brand recommendations so you don't have to repeat it every video. I, I do think about that all the time, for sure, even doing that while I'm, you know, before I end up going live. Um, but, yeah, I do. That's a gr It's a great point. I, it's, I think about that all the time. <laughs> so we're on, uh, we're, we're thinking on parallel lines here, Lolly. I appreciate it. And I'm always happy for feedback, you know, for certainly. Um, uh, obviously, I don't know what it's like to be on the other side of the camera watching and participating in these episodes. Anything that would help make that a little bit better. Um, Pascal says, uh, wait, how many cats are there? You have yellow versions and newspaper versions. Uh, the yellow versions were are now underneath this newspaper version right so i i just like i typically do on on all those episodes i take the warm yellow apply it over top of the surface and then in some instances like this then i go and apply another coat of paint on top of that to um kind of um especially if i want to create kind of a slightly off white look uh, now, of course, again, you could just mix that paint and apply it right over top of that yellow um, or or not even apply the yellow either. I think it makes a difference. I think I described it sort of like putting the pasta sauce or, or the pizza sauce on a pizza and then the cheese. You might not see that pizza sauce when you're just looking at the pizza in the box, but when you bite into it, you taste it. And it's the same sort of thing with the way our eyes work. Our eyes don't just see the top surface, they're, they're seeing through that surface. In fact, here, I mean, you can see this pencil lines, which are the first thing I put on that canvas, and then I put the yellow 
and then two layers of this off-white over top. So even though we might not see bright yellow, uh, orangey yellow, warm yellow here, like we see on the back here, that's kind of leaked out, uh, it's there, and it's it's our mind is and our, is is um, apprehending it, but we may not be aware of that happening. So, I've got five of these already queued up and ready to go, and um, I think it's time to move on to my next step. <laughs> marinated cats. I hope I didn't say marinated cats. I was hope I was saying marinated steaks. <laughs> but maybe, maybe. Um, uh, Lolly says, just to say, Michael, I could personally listen to you talk about paint or anything else for hours, LOL. But I thought it might save you some time and repetition. It's a lot. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, Lolly. You're so sweet. Um, well, he says, this is a cat lover's dream paint class today. <laughs> it is. And funny thing is, I'm allergic to cats, so I don't often spend very much time with cats. But this is the kind of cats that I do like. Cats that are beautiful, well-behaved, and don't make my eyes itchy or my nose run. <laughs> so, um, let's, um... Uh, Let's move on to our next step here. Okay, so we've got the image transferred onto our canvases and we've then applied the Impre Matura on those canvases and then also applied uh, a layer of kind of off-white over top of them. So our canvases are nice and prepped and ready to go for the next step but you know while we're waiting for these to dry why don't we just take a little bit of a moment to talk briefly about Andy Warhol and the the, the story behind these cats so let's jump up here so um Again, I've, I, the last two episodes, you know, back in December, I spoke kind of quite in depth about Andy Warhol. Um, and so really today, I just want to really focus on the story behind these cats. But just as a quick review, Andy Warhol's born in 1928 and passes away at the young age of 58 years old in 1987. Uh, definitely an unexpected death. There were lawsuits after he died. Really essentially complications from a relatively routine surgery that he had. He got an infection and passed away kind of suddenly. And, you know, one wonders, you know, if Warhol was lived another 20, 30, 40 years, what would have happened, what kinds of work he would have created. And you can pretty much guarantee that, you know, things like, artificial intelligence had he lived to today he would be totally on top of stuff like that he loved using new tools new technology and i'm sure had you know i mean he was one of the first artists to use video uh he used cassette recorders um he used he was one of the first artists to use the, the mouse, the Apple. They, in fact, made a commercial with him using and making artwork on a mouse. Uh, fax machines and so on and so forth. So um, uh, Warhol was, was a consummate in, um, innovator and also an iconoclast. And particularly kind of some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, the way that he used printmaking was basically doing it as wrong as possible, right? He was one of those persons that he might be shown the the way to do it and then would just sort of take it and then kind of transform it and use those techniques for his own purposes. And uh, I find it super inspiring. In fact, one of the techniques that we're going to talk about a little bit later, I haven't even talked about it yet, is his so-called blotted line technique, like blotting, like if you're you're 
soaking up um, something that, like a stain, right? Where he used this technique, which really, to, to my mind, I can't really think of anybody else who's used that technique since because his work is so closely identified with that technique. And you can't say that about a lot of artists. Um, you know, it's not like there's only one person who ever used acrylic paint, right? Uh, but there's really only one person who really used the this technique we're going to talk about here shortly. Um, so really with today's episode, uh, what we're talking about is these cats that he created in the early 1950s. And so uh, this is really some of the first stuff that he did when he moved to New York from his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So Andy Warhol grows up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and during the 1950s, you know, this is a pretty rough city. You know, it's a very working class town. Um, you know, it's a, known for its steel industry, you know, a lot of blue collar work. And Andy Warhol was a young, effeminate, and ultimately gay man and was definitely an outsider in that community. And so he was always really interested in drawing. And so when he uh, kind of made his mind up that he wanted to pursue illustration as a career, his mother was super supportive of him. And together they moved from Pittsburgh to New York City in 1951. And... Uh, one of the things that they did is to, let me see if, is there, um, well, one of the, the things that Andy would do would be to create these little promotional books uh, of drawings that he would give away to uh, his friends and family, as well as magazine editors and book publishers, in order to find work. So here's some of these books that have sort of since been kind of published that um, are similar to what the self-published books that he created in the 1950s. Let me just zoom in here um, so that we can kind of see this together. So this is one of them. Now, this is not exactly what uh, he produced. This is sort of like a, a, a collection of some of those, those drawings. Uh, but it does give us an idea of the kinds of drawings that Andy Warhol was producing when he first arrived to New York City in 1951. You can see here's the image that we're going to do today. You'll see that there's a few different colors. And also that the color on the tail is missing. Um, you know, Andy Warhol was an animal lover. He had dogs and lots of cats. It's believed at, at one point, you know, uh, in the early 1950s, that he had upwards of 25 cats living at his in his apartment that he shared with his mother. And that's another thing people maybe aren't aware of because you think of Andy Warhol as this kind of wild socialite iconoclast figure you know deep into the bohemian rock and roll um, subculture of New York City in the early 1960s but during that entire time Andy is living with his mother his mother's living with him down the hall of his apartment his mother would often make him breakfast in the morning. And one of the things too about a lot of these early artworks that he did is all of this writing was actually done by Andy's mother, uh, Julia Warhola. Um, so the the look of these of these artworks with the specific blotted line technique that we'll talk about in a little bit um, is uh, is a, is a big feature and uh, an iconic part of his early style, but arguably even more so is this really beautiful handwriting that his mother did 
throughout um, throughout the 1950s. In fact, even at times signed Andy's name for him, <laughs> which I think is very funny and also very Warhol. Uh, that, that Warhol would sort of outsource his own signature to his mother. Um, so I just want to show... So one of the things that, that Warhol did is he would have outlined these on just like uh, just the, the, the black outlines and then he could reprint them with all sorts of different colors separately. So I'll just quickly show some more of these. So this gives you an idea. So he would produce little books like this. And here's another one themed with angels uh, that he could use to try to, to kind of create some business for him. Very smart, right? Um, rather than just sort of sitting around, sending out, you know, resumes, trying to get work. Warhol was like hustling. He was like, okay, how, I need to make a name for myself. I'm going to make these little books. I'm going to hand them out to as many important people as possible. And he would also, st he started making his own Christmas cards around this same sort of time and sending them out to different people. And they became kind of collector's items, even b by, for editors and, and publishers who didn't hire him, you know, eagerly wanted to get on his mailing list so that they could get these little Christmas cards um, from him. And, you know, that talk about a, you know, a great business strategy. You know, if you've got people that, you know, haven't hired you that really want your artwork and they look forward to it every year, well, that keeps you on the front of mind so that if the project does come up, they're like, wow, I keep getting these like postcards in the mail from this young kid, Andy Warhol, you know, maybe I can use him for this next project, right? So, um, I just love all of these early illustrations here. You know, I think we think of Andy Warhol uh, as kind of a robot, somebody who just copied things like soup cans and Brillo boxes and pictures of Marilyn Monroe, but at the very heart of Warhol's, um, uh, uh, of his of his career is somebody who really knew how to draw and had a really skill, uh, really fine uh, uh, feel for color as well. And I think that is something that that often gets lost. And and Warhol himself, he 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 amped up that idea of himself just being a copyist, someone who was just flagrantly reproducing artwork and that he had no real talent whatsoever. Uh, he, he really liked to, um, uh, I think he, he thought that that was, you know, cause it was, it's talk about being, uh, taking people by surprise. Like you have someone like Pablo Picasso, who's all about bravado, very macho, I am the best, I'm the best painter, I'm a real man, and you know, when I'm not painting, I'm going and watching bullfights and smoking cigars and getting drunk with the guys, you know, and I'm the I'm the best artist alive. Andy Warhol's whole strategy is to go the opposite way, be like, I don't I'm not really good at anything, I just trace things from the newspaper, right? And that is just as likely to get people's attention as some artist who's who's going around boasting of their genius, right? So it did create this sort of lasting impression of Warhol as being um, this sort of talentless hack. But uh, I think, you know, once you start to kind of get to know his work a little bit, you're just like, wow, this guy was really talented. Or is, it's not a surprise that he became as well known as as he he was, and it's and it's not some great travesty of art history. Um, 
So here, but this this book here is just like a whole bunch of just drawings that Warhol did in the in the early 1950s and beyond. And just if we're not going to go through this whole book here, but what I do want to show is just a little bit of his process here, if I can. So this is something we're going to come back to a little bit later. This blotted line technique and him using tracing paper to create images. And so. Um, I'm trying to think which is the original. I think, I think this might. Okay, so what what Warhol? You know, maybe I'll come back to instead of me trying to explain how this is done, we'll just do it a little bit later on. Um, but these are all a lot of these like here. This carb. This is uh, tracing paper that he's traced images from the newspaper up. And I've, in the video description below, I've linked to a video that the Andy Warhol Foundation itself created to show you the process that he used. So you can actually watch that as well. Let's see if there's anything else in here worth looking at. Um, you can see some of these images that he, st he started making, these shoe images. A lot of these kinds of things that he was doing, once he really started to get full-time work in New York as an illustrator for various different magazines, he used the same process. Um, I just think some of these are just so... They're, they're very weird but also just like super cool. They also remind me a lot of the work by, um, of, of artists like Gustav Klimt and maybe even more so Egon Schiele, the, I don't even think we've done a Schiele painting before. Maybe that's, The other thing that this process that Warhol did of tr of tracing things from newspapers and magazines allowed him to do was to get the 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 the, the just to kind of create multiples uh, like stamp like qualities reproduce the same image over and over again but in an analog fashion so rather than requiring like a much more complex printmaking setup he used all of this these kind of homemade printmaking techniques, which I think, again, is, a, is another genius part of Warhol, is how can I create many images, but do it all just at my kitchen table, right? Without having to require, like, a really complex lithography process. I mean, he did collaborate with printmakers later on when he had kind of unlimited funds, but it just shows, like, the the his resourcefulness throughout the years um let me see so the many of the images that we're going to be looking at in fact i think all of them were from this book that he produced and i think this is probably his his greatest self-published project that he did and it's called 25 cats name sam and one blue pussy and the misspelling here, instead of 25 cats named Sam and one blue pussy, he's the there's it's missing the D here. And that's because the title was handwritten by Andy's mother, Julia. And she was, um, you know, an, an immigrant herself and English was not her first language. And while she had this beautiful handwriting, she would sometimes make small mistakes. And I think when when um, she made this mistake, let's see if we can see this a little bit larger. When she made this mistake, Andy was just like, that's great, I like it. <laughs> let's just keep it like that. Which, you know, is, is again, very uh, Warhol to incorporate mistakes rather than to kind of be like, ah, oh, this didn't work out, this is trash, it's garbage, let's do it all over again, is be like, yeah, that's great. And so again, it shows his, 
his um his ability to accept uh failure perhaps or mistakes to do like what bob ross talked about the happy accident you know, and, and potentially create something kind of poetic. I don't know if, if they're, you know, when you say 25 cats named Sam and one blue pussy, if there's, if there is anything kind of new that comes out of it. But it is interesting, like, I was, when I was reading, you know, here, you know, like, um, does it say in here? Yeah, his mother, Julia Warhol, did the calligraphy and is responsible for the dropped D in the title. Like, I was doing this research. I've looked through this original book. I, we don't have them here in the Vancouver Public Library, but um, I've looked through a version, a, a reproduction of this book. And for the past 20 years, I did not realize that there was that spelling mistake in the title of the book. And... Uh, which I think is kind of funny. I think maybe that's a little bit of Warhol just sort of trying to see how closely we're paying attention to it, right? And so it took me, I'm like, the dropped D? Like, what is, what, where's the, where's the missing D in this, in this title? And it took me, I don't know, like five minutes reading it over and over. Oh, it's, it just says 25 cats name Sam, not named Sam. Oh. And another kind of funny thing about this book is that there's only 19 images in there. Um, six, and so really what there is, is there's 16 cats in that book. There's not 25 cats. There's only 16 of them in this book. So that's also another kind of funny thing, little discrepancy. It's The book says it's 25 cats name Sam and and potentially another, a blue one here, so really 26 cats. Um, but in fact, there's only 16 in the book, right? So I, you, you, you kind of wonder what Warhol's doing in that moment. Is, is he trying to say something there? Or is it just him just showing us his um, playful nature, a little bit of mischievousness, which, you know, if you know anything about cats, cats can be a little bit, um, what's a, what's a good word for cats? You know, a little, they're, they're always up to something, right? Cats have a bit of a mind of their own and, and I'm, I'm a, I would probably say I'm a bit more of a dog lover myself, but dogs, you know, they live to, to please, right? Cat, dogs want to make their owners happy and that they get the, the most pleasure out of life by 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 doing what they're told cats on the other hand don't cats um uh seem like they almost go out of their way to uh be defiant right so i just think there's maybe a little maybe when warhol saw the the book coming together realized oh man it's going to cost me an extra you know, twenty dollars per book to to do all twenty six cats. Well, let's just take ten of them out of, the, and let's see if anybody notices. And probably the vast majority of people who ever looked at that book had no idea that it was essentially missing ten cats, and that the title was had an had a spelling mistake. So, um, let's see. Anything else I want to mention here? the Warhol home in Pittsburgh uh, where he was originally from just kind of zooming back out here you can see like Pittsburgh's not too close not too far away from Cleveland and and you know the Canadian border here on the other side you've got kind of the southern Ontario London where my mother's from you know so this this is kind of like the industrial heartland of the United States. Uh, let's just look at. Um, I should also let's just also take a, a moment here just to uh, just acknowledge like Andy's mother and and her her role in Andy's career and life. As I said, like she moved with Andy to New York. 
uh, to help support him and his ambition to become a, a professional illustrator. And, you know, it, it makes me think of like, you know, a, a hockey mom or, you know, a, a, a parent who will move across the country to support their child's ambition to become an actor or actress. And, you know, that's that really says something how the relationship that the two of them had, or he was definitely a little bit of a mama's boy. Uh, and, you know, throughout his basically adult life she was there with him you know you know looking at his work offering advice uh consoling him and uh uh it's funny that she also did some work on her own but she would even sign her name as andy warhol's mother and if there were parties the rare times that she did attend any social functions uh with Andy, she would introduce herself just as Andy's Andy Warhol's mother, as opposed to Julia Warhola, which probably just to save that confusion because you know Andy Warhol's original name was Andrew Warhola, and the the A was sort of mistakenly not um, added to his name at one time when his his artwork was published, and again a very Warholian thing to do was to be like. Like, oh, they spelt my name wrong. Oh, that's great. I, I kind of like that even better. Let's go. Let's instead of being Warhola, let's be. Let's just go with the name that they've published me under, War, Warhol. That sounds great. That's maybe it's easier. And Warhol, being someone who is fascinated with commercialism and and um, and capitalism, you know, products and and branding and packaging probably recognized kind of like oh that's it's easier for people to pronounce maybe warhol sounds to quote unquote ethnic warhol sounds maybe more more like a brand of some kind easier for you know regular joe to to pronounce perhaps and like that sounds great let's let's go with that so um you know, I, do, I, mean, I haven't read this particular article here, but, you know, just, it just leaps right out that they talk about her as one of history's unsung champions behind creative icons. I would say, like, one of, you know, the unsung artists of, of our time, right? And the role that she played um, in creating that very iconic handwritten script throughout Warhol's work. just gonna see I did something similar years ago I for I had my mother write uh, some some uh, band names and stuff for a record album that I designed as well so I had my own mom who also has really good handwriting <laughs> write the name of a band that was ended up being used as on the front cover of the record album and all the stickers and t-shirts and everything. And so for me, just kind of, and it, to be honest, I did that without knowing that about this whole story. This is years ago about um, uh, Julia Warhol's involvement in Warhol's work. But for me, that was sort of just kind of a fun little thing that whenever I would look at those t-shirts, people walking around, I'm like, oh, my mom did made a little bit of that. That's kind of cool. Um, and so just kind of keeping that little family connection going on is, is kind of, is pretty satisfying, I think. So uh, in that way, I've, I, I can really understand why Warhol would have done that, right? That, that, that every time one of his works is reproduced, Oh, there's there's a little bit of mom's presence there in that work alongside um, his own. Okay, so I, I think I, I don't know if I want to talk maybe any more about uh, about this. There's lots of videos and articles online about uh, Andy's. Uh, love of, of animals, um, cats, dogs, um, uh, horses, even, right? So, you know, if you're if you're an animal lover, Andy is definitely, uh, you know, um, someone who is uh, um, 
who shares that affinity with you. Okay. So let's... So now that we've had a little bit of opportunity to learn a little bit about Andy Warhol's um, work that he was creating in the 1950s, the works that directly, that these works that we're working on today, um, to which they belong, that, that specific period of his career, let's uh, start doing some painting. And let's get some uh, of uh, uh, these cats colored in. And let's just quickly kind of take a look at uh, these different cats and the way that we um, could color them. So this is uh, the, the one that I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on. I've got a number of these prepped and ready to go, this particular cat. One thing you'll notice is that the original actually has a white tail or the tail just has no paint inside of it. I just added a little bit of extra red in there just because I felt it was looked a little bit um, um, blank. But certainly if you want, you could just not paint the tail or and leave that, that white. Here we've got a pink cat and a yellow cat and a blue cat. Now, Warhol reproduced all of these images with, with different colors. So rather than sort of baking them into a, to a painting like this, he would just do them the outlines in black, do the, the colors on a separate piece, and then he could you know, print dozens of them in all sorts of different kinds of colors. I'm just gonna do them all baked in, in one together, but I, I do want to suggest that you could use whatever colors you want for your paintings Let's say with this one, if you like this one the most, and you're like, I'd like that one, but I wish it was in pink or in purple or, or uh, orange, then you should use any of or all of those colors. Add stripes in there if you prefer, or polka dots too. Um, those are all things that Warhol would love to do. In fact, earlier on, we were looking um, in this book of cats. There were one of those images featured this cat in gold with actual gold leaf here. So that's potentially something you could do if you like. So um, this is the image that we're about to, to do here. And here's one of the canvases that I've got going. So what I wanna do here is um, earlier this morning before I, um, uh, I had a little guest join me to help do this next step. Uh, so what I want to do is play that recording for you here and show you how one might go about painting these here. second okay so what you're about to see oh goodness is i'm gonna i created these stencils you, you may have seen earlier on when i was doing the the image transfer process i traced these um, the, the template also onto some pieces of board, right? Here's a FedEx envelope that I traced it onto. And then I cut them out so that I could quickly apply color onto canvases and onto um, paper. So let me play this here. Brush for a second. You're so tall. I didn't think you'd be so big. 
<laughs> so that's my daughter. That's uh, my daughter, Edie. And she is uh, about four and a half or, well, yeah, almost four and a half now. And you may have seen her a few times throughout the years on these episodes. And she's going to help me paint the, um, the color inside a number of these cats to help get them started. And then after they've been painted, I'm going to come back and paint over top the outlines around uh, these forms here. Let's see if I can all right, hide that controller. <laughs> Good girl. Look at you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, you ready, ready to make, make some, some art, art Daddy? Daddy? Okay. Let's roll up your sleeves. Okay. It is a cat. Daddy! Yeah! It is a cat. Now you're going to notice that some of the paint kind of gets underneath the stencil. Which, you know, in a typical situation could be kind of disappointing or kind of frustrating. Okay. Let's just see how we've done so far. But considering the circumstances, and also that this is Andy Warhol would have found this you know, very, would have been right in the line of, of, of the way that he works. Okay, you ready? Cool. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Okay. That's one. You're doing great. You're doing great. So I think this is the FedEx stencil. Let's see if this one does any different. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, yeah, should we see, see what, what it looks, looks like? like? I know, no, we, we just want to paint. paint. I know, I know. Great. Ah! Sure. 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 Uh, should we try one? Let's try one, one more. more. Last one we do together. Okay. Oh. Yay. <laughs> 
Oh, they're down. Okay. Oh, look at all the comments there, people. She looks so big. She looks so grown up. It's true. It starts. It's. 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 It's adorable, and as a parent, it's hard when your kid just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um. <laughs> Barbara says, "New teacher tonight. Great job." <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, oh, there we are. Okay, so what I've got here, here is, um, I'll come back to the other ones that I did on paper with the tracing paper uh, in a little bit here. We'll do that towards the end of today's class. Um, but here we've got that image on the canvas, and here I've got an, a second one that I haven't done anything to yet. So I think what I'll do is is get this next one ready and then I'll, I'll do the other ones at the same time. So maybe let's get a little bit of paint onto this palette here. So let's take a bit of warm red. Think about the other cats we got. Make that we'll do a a cool red here. For a, a cool pink for that one. This one, this will do a, it's, it's got a bit of a cool yellow quality. So let's put some cool yellow in here. That's a cool blue and cool yellow. Now, I'm, I'm using acrylic paint. I do have acrylic inks. I was contemplating using ink for this. Um, but I think I'm just gonna use acrylic paint.
Well, he says, thank you. Uh, that was so cute, Michael. Thanks for showing. I couldn't stop smiling. I appreciate that. I wanted to do something with, with my daughter on these um, live streams, but she's either at school when I'm doing this, or she's or I'm taking care of her when <laughs> So it's uh, it's hard to kind of make time. So today, before I took her to school, I um, thought, you know what, let's uh, try. In fact, we were late for school so that I could record that. But I was like, you know what, this is this is a priority. Okay. Uh, another thing that I might do here is kind of give a little bit of transparency. Now, when I did this one with my daughter, I just sort of. The, the priority was just to get something down there. And I, I used the paint right out of the tube um, so that it would kind of prevent... You just make it a little bit easier when we're using these stencils. But I think what I want to do is get a little bit more of a kind of subtly watery quality going here. Um, so... Let me just think. I haven't quite thought through this step yet. What medium I might want to use. Okay, let me just unplug. Be just gonna hunt for supplies for a moment. All day long today, I was like, don't forget to get your calligraphy stuff out, Michael. Because you're going to need that for today's episode. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. And then here we are live. And I realized I forgot to do that. And that I have no idea where things are. I'm currently... Uh, the reason why we didn't do an episode last week is I'm in the middle of a giant Mary Kondo purge cleaning this entire house and um and eventually the studio here so i will eventually have some control over my life <laughs> but uh not at this present moment clearly so oh man that is deeply deeply upsetting and frustrating I am uh, in the back of my mind trying to think of if 
there's a way I could make my own calligraphy pen. Gosh, where would I have put those tools? I mean, I've got, it's kind of hard to see, but there are bins of things here. of important for today, Michael. Maybe this will work. I, gosh, this is... I haven't used this thing in probably 25 years. This, this, by the way, is, is an old cigar box. I love these cigar boxes for paintbrushes. And these are a whole bunch of my small detail paintbrushes that I usually I use for my own artwork. Um, okay. Anyway. Let's... Um, that out of the way. So what I was looking for was some medium that would give me a bit more of a fluid-like quality. And um, I've got two different materials here. I've got a flow aid, an airbrush medium. I do also have pouring medium. But both of these here are for... Um, uh, to give like a a much more watery consistency to a, to paint. So I'm just thinking, which one? I think what I'm going to do is use uh, this airbrush medium. And we'll, we'll see how effective this is. This could be um, another, um, it could be a mistake, but you never know if you've made a mistake until you make it. So uh, I'm going to take this airbrush medium and, oops, so this is a brand new tube. Maybe I've got one that's open to I think this one's opened. No, this one's not opened either. Okay, let's just use this one then. Shake. So you can see it's like super liquidy. Liquidy? Is that is that a word? Liquidy? So the purpose of airbrush medium is to thin the paint enough that you could put it into um an airbrush um, tool so you can you turn it basically into like a fluid acrylic now of course it does you know make the paint more transparent but not as transparent for instance as like um, glazing fluid or even matte medium part of its goal is to try to keep the 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 opacity of to, to thin the paint but try to keep as much of the opacity intact as possible so my goal here is to try to get 
a little bit come on more of that watercolor kind of quality but while using acrylic paint here um, and maybe I'm going to start out with This is kind of nice to paint with. It's probably hard for this to really show up on camera. Because it's probably just the colors might just blow right out. So what is hap the another thing that I let me see if I can get a different angle on here. Probably not going to show up very well, but um, as I apply this paint, it has a self-leveling quality, and what that means is that I can apply it in kind of blobs, and that rather than sort of keeping its texture. It's slowly going to kind of disperse back into the other wet areas. 
and lose its uh, volume or or not volume it's well it's it's the the it will lose its well I guess yeah the texture won't be quite as voluminous so um, it'll level out again so I can kind of be a little bit thick with this paint knowing that it will eventually settle a bit So I'm going to set this to dry here. That's going to take a little bit of time um, for that to happen. Um, I don't, don't want to show this now. Maybe I'm gonna. I'll do all of these cats first on the canvas, and then we'll we'll do the other ones all together. Okay, so I'll get all of these out. even though it would be more efficient if I just did them all at once. Let's just try to keep things organized. Kathy says, family but I got a cold on the plane down long travel day but better than snow in BC whereabouts are you you're oh my goodness checking in from Kauai Kathy oh my goodness I'm jealous <laughs> although I can't complain I, I, last week I was in Sydney Australia so I, I was fortunate enough to also take a little bit of a trip out of the country and to somewhere a little bit tropical uh, which one should we do next let's go to let's see here okay so this next one we're going to do with pink and what I want to do is, is to, I'm going to use some cool uh, red and white and then to get, try to get that same kind of quality. So let's take our white paint. So here I'm going to add a lot more of this airbrush medium here. Get even more of a watery texture and see. That'll 
effective this is. And let's also just compare these. Colors not quite as fluorescent as the one that he create or has there, that pink, but I think probably good enough. So you can kind of be, you know, make these lines and it can be kind of a little bit sloppy looking. But then we'll just clean it up with that larger brush afterwards. So I know probably most people do not have airbrush medium just sitting around on a shelf at home. Uh, you could use water for this or um, ink or acrylic ink or watercolor. In fact, Warhol himself used watercolor or, um, or paint dyes. The, the Warhol Foundation suggests you use paint dye, but that's, that's a very obscure art material that is, is you, know, you know, not something that is very commonly found. You know, that, that goes back to the 50s and 60s when artists were really making most of their own art supplies from scratch as artists had done for centuries before. So, <clears throat> unless you're trying to make your own fraudulent copy of this and trying to, you know, you want to use the exact materials that, he, that Warhol himself used, I don't think you need to go to that, that um, end.
So I'm also expecting as this dries for it to become even more transparent. Okay, let's clean these up as well. So I think maybe while these dry, I'll start the other ones and then we'll do all the outlining simultaneously at the very end. I also think I may have caught a cold on the flight back from Australia. Um, man, last week I was laid out. Oof. Not, it's not fun to come back from vacation and to be suddenly <laughs> sick. Oh, it's terrible, isn't it? Okay, so for this next one, let's... paint with some of this cool yellow. So once again, we'll put our fluid or airbrush medium here. Now there is a little, I did, clearly didn't wash my brush very well, and a little bit of red soaking out of there, but I also don't mind that. Now the, obviously the eyes in all of these paintings are slightly different color. I want to make sure this is as dry as possible before I paint those other colors there. Otherwise those colors will bleed together. Just as it would if we were using watercolor. Should I go off the edges of the picture here? Or just leave it like the way Warhol did, so sort of just bleeding out a little bit. So 
So you can see kind of how thick this paint is as I... I don't need to clean these that thoroughly because I'm just about to use them to make turquoise, aren't I? I'm going to try to dilute this even further.
Okay, so let's see if we can deal with this little mistake here. <clears throat> like we got it. Okay, not so bad. Now, I, I kind of like how that looks in, on mine, but let's say just, just so that we can um, um, deal with potential problems that might, might occur to people along the way. Let's say this, um, I, I didn't like these lines and I want to kind of soak up some of this, so let me take a little bit of some toilet paper here and see if we can soak up a little bit of unwanted paint All right so let's I'm actually surprised that it's not kind of soaking up in the way that I that maybe oh yeah, I guess a little bit if I can angle this in a way that makes that as visible So you can see it like it, it does create a little bit of but then it, it starts to level out and some of those ridges that were pretty strong before kind of start to disappear so I think my my 
my expectation is that as this dries, we might see some darker areas, but that um, for the most part, we shouldn't really have that much texture. Maybe slight um, depressions and and um, embossing effects, but for the most part, it should be relatively flat as once it's completely dry. Okay. Um, let's clean this up and then we'll show you the, the other pieces. I mean, that looks, that's pretty cool. Um, so how should I call this or differentiate this for the purposes of the channel? Tis the question. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, let's, let me see. <laughs> let's call this. Okay, now while these canvases are drying, um, what I want to do is show you something completely different. I want to do uh, try to recreate Andy Warhol's famous blotted line approach. And that one I'm going to do using watercolor paper and uh, rather than painting on canvas. So it's going to be a little bit of a different technique. Uh, and I'll let me show you how I set this whole thing up. So I'm going to play this video here.
Um, so what I've got here is a number of different supplies. I've got some uh, drawing paper, kind of a, a mixed media paper that I've had for years. Uh, I did a project in, in France and Paris like 10 years ago, and I bought a whole bunch of this paper. And so I'm going to, going to do some drawings on that paper. And then I've got three different kinds of tracing paper. I've got a Strathmore drawing paper, a Canson drawing paper, and a cheap uh, kind of, of uh, drawing or tracing paper from the dollar store. So my goal is to see if there's, you know, which one is going to be most effective for the blotted line technique here. So to start out with, what I'm doing is taping my uh, the, the outline from the Dropbox onto the onto a, a piece of this paper. And so this is basically you could kind of you could use like sketchbook paper for this. Like if you had like a thicker sketchbook paper, uh, the sketchbooks that I like to use are the Canson mixed media. They have like a light blue cover. So you can see I've got the carbon paper again underneath, and now I'm just going to trace over all of these lines. And so let's just show you kind of me zipping by here. Okay, so I, I went all over all those lines. So underneath that image is the tr the outline of just the 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 cat it's the the outline of the cat not the all the details inside i'm going to do trace over all those lines right now so i'm going to have two different um uh, uh sort of like little shutters on a window here you'll you'll kind of see as as we go forward i just want to show you all of these steps so I'm going to take a pencil and then go around all of this. So you can see I've done most of the, the line work around there, including all those little lines around the collar of the cat. And that's what it looks like underneath. And I should say, so right now, this first um, piece of, of tracing paper I'm using is the Canson tracing paper. And I even make little notes to myself on top there of which tracing paper I've just used. Just so that I can be absolutely sure I'm not... Uh, I don't get them mixed up. I'll remember which is which. So here's another one. Take the carbon paper. And same sort of thing. But let me see, I just basically did the outline there. I don't need any more details than that for that specific part. Uh, now I'm going to use some of this cheap tracing paper from the dollar store. And I'm glad I did th this using multiple different kinds of tracing paper because you're going to see here. And what I'm just I've done there is I put the the tape on my clothing to try to take some of the stickiness of that tape off so that it doesn't tear the paper, um, or at least doesn't tear as badly. It'll come off a little bit easier. So now I'm going to trace over this image. Now you'll notice here that the image on the other side of this tracing paper is barely visible. Unlike the Canson tracing paper, where I could see very clearly the, the, the pencil lines on both sides of the tracing paper, oddly enough, when it's, um, 
on uh, on the the one side of this one, I can't. It's it's like it's almost like a one-way mirror. So that is really surprising. I did not expect that kind of result. So I'm going to do this another time, a second time. Right, do another tracing. And now I'm using this uh, Strathmore tracing paper, um, which also has the features that pretty much the same issue as the cheap dollar store tracing paper also um, has uh, is not as visible as I might have liked. Okay, I think um, I think you kind of get the idea here. So let's um, let's start prepping all of these. So basically, what I've got here is I began by by taping. Just as a quick review, I began by taping this down onto there and then traced it with the carbon paper. So I have the outline of the cat there and then I took the carbon paper out make remember to take the carbon paper away or you're gonna get a, a, a second set of lines and then I took the um, tracing paper taped it down so that it makes a bit of a hinge and then I traced over all the lines with the tracing paper right you can see again I made a little note here um, of the particular paper and one thing I just did is I was like I wonder how this is gonna work does it does it matter what side the tracing paper is does it matter if it's you know or because sometimes one kind of paper might have a different kind of coating on one side than the other I think they're the same they feel similar but hey you know I always kind of like doing multiple versions and testing this out so that I know for a fact what's going on rather than getting surprised. Okay, so what I want to do here, I'm going to take this off. So I want to keep this little hinge on down here. I'm going to keep that on. And I'm just going to work on applying this red into the surface here. And I'm going to get this maybe even a little bit more fluid-like. To really accentuate the watercolorness of this material. Now I'm, I'm expecting it to behave differently on paper than it does on canvas because the paper is far more likely to absorb uh, the this paint, whereas on the canvas it's more likely to kind of just sit there right on top. So probably the main effect that I'm going to notice is that it might appear to kind of dry a little bit faster, or at least soak in much faster. So if I do have any kind of brush strokes that, um, that I, I'm not happy with, i got to kind of attack those pretty quickly before they're kind of baked into the into the surface here. Um, it's also likely that as the paint kind of um, um, 
it will it will sit how do I describe this it will um, I'll probably get way more of a uh, darker and lighter areas here because of the the different kind of time in which it'll kind of soak in to the paper it'll, this should soak in much faster so if I paint um, over top of an area it's already started to dry rather than it just sort of kind of mixing together you might notice that it those brush strokes will be preserved. So I've got to kind of work quickly here. Or or not. It's totally up to you how you want to work on your own version. So it, it should be, this will probably dry five times faster than the, the exact same material painted on the canvas. Because this is going to, the paper is going to absorb this paint instantly. And I expect this to probably be bone dry in about five minutes. Whereas these ones I can still see are still wet. Probably in many of the areas where it was a little bit thicker still um, you know, wet to the touch for for sure, and some of those other areas that 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 don't have less paint, but are still going, are probably going to be a little bit tacky, because it, it's going to sit more likely just right on the surface. Okay, so let's move this out of the way. Uh, So I'll just show you the ones that uh, my daughter and I did together. So here's using the stencil that we did. So I actually quite like, especially how this one turned out, you know, kind of a little bit uneven. I think it's actually really good. It's, it's very warholing. And even, you know, these little smudges and fingerprints, that is also very Warhol. Warhol would be, you know, Unlike maybe a printer who would be like, oh no, okay, we can't use that one. That's that one's trash. It's got a finger, it's a little smudge. Or I'll be like, oh no, that's great. That's great. I love it like that. So these are these other ones. I'll put those aside. I'm probably not gonna do all of this today in today's episode. Just sort of, I'll probably do a couple of them and then do the other ones on my own time and then maybe show you the results of them afterwards. Uh, which one did I do next? Let's this. So this is, or no. So this one I used um, the the cheap tracing paper from the dollar store, this tracing pad, and I think I just want to show you the difference between these two and how that image is much less visible on that side than that one see how much more transparent the Canson one is but this and and so you'd say well I guess it's just how cheap tracing paper is one is you know way more opaque 
the cheap one is way more opaque and the and the, the more expensive one is more transparent. But the Strathmore version, in fact, um, let's show you this one right here. Is very it's a little bit more transparent, um, but it's nowhere near as transparent as the Canson one. So the Canson one, I mean, it doesn't. It's harder to probably to see on camera, but I can really see it for sure. It's like one of those things. I was like, "Ooh, am I going to be able to see those lines enough to be able to do that one up here?" I don't know. So. Okay, so let's do. Let's do the pink one first. That way, maybe I won't have to clean the brushes as carefully. I kind of, I didn't sort of try to, to take the stickiness of this tape off before I applied it to this paper. So I'm just being extra cautious as I remove it to take my time so that it doesn't, tore a little bit, but not too bad. I just got a text from my mother. They're also in Hawaii right now. It's um, plus 26 there in Hawaii. My goodness. It is snowing here in Vancouver. So, um, uh, <laughs> if you're somewhere tropical right now, like Kathy, also in Hawaii, Enjoy it, because when you get back to Canada, you got some cold waiting for you back here, I'll tell you. Oh, there's Chase's, I can't stay long, but nice cat you're painting along with that music playing. Oh, that's cool. Thanks, Chase. Thanks for saying so. Okay, put a little bit more of that airbrush medium in here just to make this paint nice and transparent again. Just let's double check that this is the pink cat. Yes.
don't know if I've done a painting on paper for this channel before. I've done, what, 300 plus episodes? And all of them have been on canvas, I think. I've done a few on... Um, done a few on clothing. We did, I did it uh, for Takashi Murakami a couple of years ago. We did some on demonstrating how to print and paint on clothes. Way back when. This is a really interesting material to even paint on paper with, to be honest. Because it's obviously behaves a lot like watercolor. But I like that it's not absorbing as quickly as watercolor is. There's a maintaining a bit more, way more opacity and flexibility. It's, um, at least on this particular paper, which I suppose is a little bit more of like a drawing paper than a watercolor paper. But so far I'm actually really liking this. I've I've uh, never used paintbrush medium on paper before. Gotta say that uh, I might prefer this particular combination of, of medium and paint to watercolor. It's it's nowhere near as sort of runny as watercolor. It's got a, it's it holds its shape way more again you know maybe this is just the paper that i'm using but one of the things i i don't like about watercolor is how um at least i find in my experience how hard it is to control like how um 
in my experience, so much of watercolor painting is left to chance. And I know that there's some people who like watercolor for that particular reason. And I know there's some people who are masters at watercolor who... Um, to whom there's very little chance at all. They know exactly what they're doing and they can make it all happen. Um, but I always find watercolor... It, it's... Uh, Things happen that I, I never fully expect, which, you know, again, can be something that you might read. Some people, that's the main thing they love about it, is how they really have to um, give up a little bit of control when they're using that material. And maybe it says something about me that I'm not as, uh, I want a little bit more control over my material control freak or something Because, like, for instance, if I did this with watercolor, a lot of this would have soaked in, and it would be very hard to kind of get the le this kind of consistent, solid areas of paint here. There, I'd have a lot more um, areas where paint is sort of soaked in at different speeds and dried at different speeds, and... Uh, And, you know, while some people may really like that, um, and I think certainly Warhol did, I'm less, less so. <laughs> okay. Oh, and there's my mom in, uh, in uh, Hawaii. Watching in Hawaii. Oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> it's a little chilly there. Oh, your text said it was 26 degrees Celsius. But it's minus 30 in Calgary. I don't know if... Uh, if there's anybody in Calgary who has too much sympathy for the the cold weather currently in, that you're experiencing in Hawaii. They must be taking a break from drinking Mai Tais at the bar. Sleeping it off. Okay. So let's do the yellow on this cat. I'm just thinking probably for today, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint in all of these because I've got, I'm going to have a lot. Of <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do all of these outlines today. I may not even try. 
Um, so I think I might do what I did before, so maybe do a bunch of them off camera and then come back and um, and do a, a maybe one or two on camera and show you those results. A special bonus episode another time. This mixture is particularly frothy. I'm not sure what I did here. Did I over mix it? Um, so what that so far means is there's a lot of little bubbles here. And I don't mind that, but I do wonder if as it dries, those bubbles kind of pop and they create little little circles and so if that's something you want that's great but it could create like a slight like strange discoloration Again, I'll wait for this yellow to dry before I would even attempt to paint those orange areas.
And Lolly's got to go to sleep, but thanks again for another great stream and a bazillion brilliant cats, Michael. And thanks to little Edie, too. I'll catch up with the rest tomorrow. Good night, everybody. Good night, Lolly. Barbara's gone to bed. Okay. Uh, let's see. What do we have left? We've got one more of these. there. Awesome. So I just took my paint brushes that still had some yellow on them and dipped them right into this kind of teal green paint that I have here, hoping that a little bit more, some of the little of that yellow might come out here. And that as I paint, it might get more and more kind of greenish or bluish. So I'm going to take a little bit more of this paint here, maybe even a bit of the darker stuff. Take a big blob of it.
See, it's not kind of soaking in in the same way, which is okay. Oh, I do wonder, like, what if, let's just see if we put a bit of that paint right on the surface there. Or the, the, the brush medium right in here. One thing I just have to be a little, I've been kind of fiddling with this page for a while. Uh, it's possible that if I keep on going, that the paint, I'm, or that I might actually kind of rub a little bit of the paper away. And then, and so especially with like a drawing paper, with watercolor paper, that sh should be much less likely to happen. But with, um, paper uh drawing paper it that's that is very likely to happen okay so i think right now i'm at a bit of a crossroads in between a two major steps and i think what i want to do here is i'm just gonna going to sign off for the night and pick this up again in another episode um, so that uh, because all these are a little bit wet and I do want to to paint on them but I'm afraid if I start blow drying it these things are just going to start spreading and what I would like for this to happen is for us to dry basically like that I think that would look really cool if it did and so all of these still look very wet yeah they're all these are all still very wet so yeah let's uh one, one thing i i do feel like that the more airbrush medium i put in here the more of a watercolor quality i got right when i this is the first one that i did and there it's it doesn't look really any different than if I just painted there and maybe put a little bit of glazing fluid or matte medium to try to make it a bit more transparent. But this one, which I think was the final one of the canvases that I painted, uh, really has much more of a watery texture that I love. So 
Um, I think I think I'm gonna leave it there, and then we'll come back. Um, Maybe tomorrow we'll see. See how long these take to dry. And I may even bring the like my studio is freezing cold. That's another reason. I'm just wearing regular socks. I should have really dressed up. I didn't expect it to be snowing outside right now. Um, so I need to be a little bit warmer <laughs> next time I come into the studio. Okay. Um she says, well, I hope you don't mind, but why couldn't you paint last week? Last week I was in Australia. <laughs> so um, it was very hard to uh, do that while I was away. I didn't bring any of my supplies or cameras or anything. I was on vacation. <laughs> okay, everybody. So um, thank you for painting along and joining me today. We'll, we'll wrap up today's episode and do all the outlines all together at, in a different time here. Um, once all of these paintings have had a time to dry. So um, until then, please join the Facebook group and upload your artwork to the Facebook group so that we can all celebrate your achievements. Um, and also consider if uh, you want to support the channel leaving a small donation as little as a dollar through uh, PayPal um, or the, using the super chat function or, or you can send a check in the mail or an e-transfer by contacting me through my email address my email is on uh, the Facebook group and on my website those links are down below and then of course like subscribe hit the notification bell over the past three weeks, 150,000 people watched this channel and, and these classes, but only a couple thousand people subscribed to the channel. So, you know, if even like 20% of those people subscribed, kind of my life would change overnight and it would make it a lot easier to do more of these episodes regularly. So if you're watching and you're not subscribing, please do me a favor and do so. I know you hate it when YouTubers say things like that. But you'd be surprised how, when you mention it, the, the, the subscription rate tends to go up dramatically. Okay, everybody. Well, enjoy your evening. And until then, we'll see you again soon. Have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs>